Hi everyone and welcome to Beyond Tomorrow, a new series from the New Zealand Herald in partnership with MYOB where we tackle the unprecedented business environment affecting thousands of small and medium sized enterprises across New Zealand as the world battles to slow the spread of the novel coronavirus. I'm Will Trafford and every day I'm joined by Ingrid Cronin Knight, MYOB's country manager and today our guest Deborah Chantry, the entrepreneur and entrepreneur business coach at Ventel Business Coaching. Well Deborah joining the panel might have given you an idea about what we're discussing today. Today it is all about the pivot. Essentially keeping your business but really overhauling the business model to take advantage of I suppose, a new business environment. And it makes sense because we have data from MYOB that says essentially almost every small and medium-sized enterprise thinks the economy is going to shrink this year and unemployment could even hit double digits, outstripping what we saw during the global financial crisis. Ingrid, you have this constant dialogue with SMEs as MYOB sort of supports them through this in a way. The bottom line struggle is, is real, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for small and medium-sized businesses as they face the fact that the doors have been shut and for many of them have had um, you know, revenue dry up, uh, how they uh, meet their outgoings is absolutely real. And, uh, you know, in terms of business, it's a highly emotional thing. But what I'm really excited about this session and with Deborah is to give some guidance around some rational, level-headed thinking that you can do to think about your business and, and how you can uh, op, you know, look at operating it differently uh, uh, to, to e- e- elongate, you know, how you can uh, trade, make, meet your obligations and actually reinvigorate the business. Yeah, I totally agree. L- listen, Deborah, if we can, let's sort of run this as a sort of boot camp, perhaps. The reality is small businesses, um, to me, so often have a very emotional attachment and medium-sized uh, enterprises as well to their business model and the way things work now. Maybe you can talk us through how important it is to maybe think, a bit more destructively about how you're doing business in this really different environment. Yeah, I think the important thing to remember is that, you know, not all businesses are affected in the same way. Um, For some of the businesses I've been working with, they're actually seeing a huge growth at the moment, and that's fantastic. For others, there's no change. And in actual fact, as things start to change the levels, they might see an increase in business, they might do the same. But then there's a huge amount of us who have been massively affected in terms of, you know, our whole life has changed, our whole business has changed. And what do we need to do to sort of move that forward and decide what it is? The first question to really ask is, you know, how affected are you by what is going on? How affected will your business be? And I think I've heard Ingrid talk about this, you know, more recent um, videos. You've got to start thinking about what happens if our income decreases by 50%, by 30%, by 20%. What does that look like for us? And if that is a major issue for you, that's the time to start thinking, right, what do I do now? Yeah, we talk about it all the time, eh, Ingrid, and and we talk about sort of analysing your financial data. I had to go um, with MYOB and sort of how you do it with the software. It's pretty simple in there, right? It says money in, money out. And um, for, I guess, a lot of small and medium-sized businesses, um, that equation is not going to be fun to look at. Yeah, I think that they've taken a hit um, for some of them. Uh, you know, if you're a services business and you don't have cash flow, I, I think that there's going to be a, a huge amount of demand for hairdressers as we come out of lockdown. <laughs> so there are some businesses that, you know, as long as they can get through the next um, small period, that then um, they'll, they'll, they'll be about how can they supply. Um, but, uh, but then for a number of them, uh, yeah, as uh, you know, what you want is not only the money in, money out, but your cash and then what you think that that looks like as you model that forward uh, through those different alert levels. One of the things I'm seeing here, Deborah, um, as sort of the first notes of we are kind of running this as, as a boot camp is, look at the market and look at your product or service and ask, is that going to be a thing in the future? If we go to level three, if we go to what, um, you know, a lot of governments are talking about these, these notions of rolling lockdowns where, you know, we go down to three, then we're back up to four again. And I think we're definitely going to see that. I mean, anybody who thinks this is a four week lockdown is probably um, deluding themselves at the moment because we're definitely going to be going for those different rolling things. So you have to start thinking about, yes, how does that affect my business in the different levels? But more importantly, there's a whole new world. Even if we get back to a supposed normal, it's going to be very, very different. And if you think about it with businesses that may or may not survive, even the landscape is going to change. So one of the first things you need to do is go, hey, what does the new world look like? And what are the opportunities in that? So as Ingrid said, it's quite an exciting time because if you're in that realm of, hey, my business 
business won't change too much. Hey, use the time right now to work on systems and processes and getting all your ducks in a row. But if you're in that realm of, hey, things are going to change quite significantly, think about the opportunities that actually might open up for you. Yeah, I guess you get to put that entrepreneurial sort of head on, if you like, that maybe you haven't been able to do as you're managing the day-to-day of the business. I've got some notes here about thinking how your customer thinks. Think about the problem that your business solves and how you would still do that or do something slightly different in the new market. And I think it's also important to go back to basics in this time as well and think about, you know, you said it's an emotional thing. The, the people who started the business, they did it because they're very passionate about something. They have a core purpose. They have some reason why they're doing it. I think it's important that we actually go almost back to sort of becoming a startup business and going, hey, what is our core purpose? What is our vision? What do we want to achieve? And then what can we develop that will still be in line with what we're trying to do? So we're not talking about, you know, moving completely away from what you're doing, because I think you'll find that quite impossible. But if you look at, okay, why do we exist? What's our core purpose? What are our core values? What can we now offer to our customers in this environment? Yeah, and I guess one of the other notes um, that we've got here, Ingrid, is talking about efficiency and thinking about what you can do to be stronger, be a more efficient business and, and reduce cash burn. Uh, when you look at uh, your business and also the opportunity of technology, you know, there's no doubt that everyone uh, is getting a crash course in remote working. Uh, and that uh, I've seen people and talking to SMEs where they're thinking about, okay, how can I do remote course delivery now? At the areas where they had never thought that they would do it before because they thought face-to-face was really important, but now it's forced them to think about how they uh, could deliver it, and that that ultimately is is a more efficient means. Or uh, in terms of you know, using um, you know different uh, it, it, talent and labour pools, and where they can be more cost effective, and if they can contribute to uh, what you're working on, do they have to be full time employees? Can they be con- a contract pool that you can pull in as and when you need it, and flexing that those um, cost bases? Or can you just streamline operations? You don't need necessarily the property anymore. You found a way to work without it, so then can you cut your costs that way? There's a, there's a whole lot of efficiency. If you think about um, you know, your supply and, and, and actually how you produce the service that you're offering, um, I think that at, in lockdown, we've, we've been forced to use technology and that is creating a whole heap of um, innovative thoughts for people. Deborah, if you're a bit of a meat and potatoes business, right, and you've sort of, maybe you, you've kind of done the same thing for a really long time, what are some of the tips to sort of, think a bit more um, entre- in a slightly more entrepreneurial way. I've got some notes here about, you know, maybe crowdsourcing it a bit, going to your customers and asking them what they'd like to see from you and possibly even talking to some of your younger employees. I, I once spoke to um, a business owner that I was working with about the notion that you're, one of your um, more agitating employees that's constantly questioning everything that might have been, you know, might have been a bit harder for you to manage in the past, they might actually bring some pretty awesome ideas to the table, right? If they're highly critical of what you're doing usually. I think it's absolutely true. Like we do business a certain way and we get really used to doing it. We get very emotionally attached to the way we do it. Um, but what I'm sort of learning from the businesses I'm working with at the moment is sometimes the customers actually want something else. So when they're not able to do what they normally do and they go out and they ask their customers what do they want, they're actually uncovering a whole raft of new opportunities for customers. And so for me, it's like going back to being a startup in some respects. You go, hey, what is the opportunity out there? Let's go and talk to our customers. If it's something, if you're an idea that you think maybe won't require a huge amount of investment, you might just talk to a couple of customers, launch what we call an MVP, a minimum viable product, give it a go, see if it works, get feedback from the customers and work on the fly. Or if it's something that you think might require a significantly more investment, you might actually go through a proper market validation process and go, hey, you know, what can we actually do? But you're absolutely right. It's not up to you as the business leader to come up with the ideas. Your role is to lead and you need to engage with your team. You need to engage with your team, your suppliers, your customers. Ask for help. Get them on board. Get the annoying young person that in the past you wanted to strangle and go, hey, come on, tell me what you could do if this was your business. Can you change the way you sell uh, your product essentially or, you know, pivot the, the product itself? Is there a new category that you can focus on or maybe streamline your operation as some of your other products or services sort of the demand goes away uh, there? Would there be a new demand trend? 
that you can satisfy potentially and will supply chain disruption open a new opportunity? In other words, if you can't get things from China, maybe you make something locally or vice versa, or there's more demand for your product in international markets, go more broadly. And finally, is it maybe time to start something new all together? I think that all those things are really important to review. I mean, the world is going to change. It's not just New Zealand. The whole world is going to change and we are going to be affected. We're also, like it or not, you know, we've got to be pragmatic when you go into an economic downturn. So some of the products and services that maybe in the past were considered sort of luxury items, may, there may not be the demand for it. So I know, again, um, some of the examples we've seen of people taking advantage of things is looking at and going, okay, what do the levels currently create for us? What can we do in this particular level? What can we do right here, right now? And as we move to the levels, we might have to change as well. So I don't think it's going to be a case of one sing- single pivot. I think in actual fact, it's the time to be having regular meetings with your team and discussing the different opportunities as they arise on a more regular basis to make sure that you can meander through it. And pivoting is not just about changing the business model, but it could be about changing the way you engage with customers and the communications that you have. So if I'm really honest, when I first kind of heard about the lockdown, I was really nervous. I thought, oh, God, I love being face-to-face with people. I hate not being able to be in a room with somebody. And as time has gone on, I've gone, actually, this isn't quite so bad. I can live with this. Um, Now, that's just a really simple example. But for a lot of businesses, you know, your customers, they're going to change the way they expect to engage with you. And so it's not just about the actual business model, but it's actually about the whole customer engagement piece. You know, how do we now move forward um, and talk to these customers as they want to be spoken to? How do they want to engage with us? I mean, online shopping is a classic example. I've been doing it since it first got launched because I love the, the, the simplicity and the ease of it. But now people are being forced to do it. Does that mean their whole behavior changes and they won't want to go into a supermarket moving forward? Um, so you have to take that example and go, what does that mean for our business? What could that possibly mean in terms of the way our customers are going to change the way they want to engage? So it isn't just the model, but it's actually the way you communicate and the way you engage with people as well. The internet one, I guess, is a really interesting one for me. And yeah, I guess in many ways you look at these restrictions and for some of these, you know, perhaps retailers and stuff like this, this may be crunch time, essentially. Um, We've seen the death blow hit some of these retailers from e-commerce before a scenario like this. Now with all the social distancing and lockdowns and stuff like this, e-commerce could never be more essential, surely, Ingrid. Oh, look, e-commerce is vital, I think, for um, clients trading uh, and uh, ensuring that you can get your, your products and services a- out there. Um, it obviously is not every business has to um, focus on it, but it is a channel uh, and, and a way with which you can in- instantly connect and trade uh, with people. And, and I think that what you'll see is uh, with international trade restrictions um, or not so much as restrictions, but difficulties, uh, you, you, you know, the opportunities really are in the domestic market. Uh, you know, can you source more local products and will people be buying more local? And we've already, you know, in our consumer survey, we know that uh, many businesses like to support, you know, your local um, environment. I think that I expect to see that we'll see that um, in- increase. We haven't got any data on that yet, uh, but I do think that there will be a trend uh, to look at domestically what can we source uh, and-, and who can we supply to and how, how to meet um, the domestic market needs. Traditionally, some of these more traditional businesses may have seen e-commerce as a threat as opposed to an opportunity. When it is crunch time, all of a sudden, that it's time to really pivot that mindset and go, well, if there's a potential that my business doesn't exist at all, or maybe I do something like I cannibalize a bit of my margin or something like that, but potentially open up to some more customers and, 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 and that sort of thing, um, that, that can only be good for a small business, surely, Deborah. I think some people have had their head in the sand for a while and not wanted to go into the online space, not wanted to in- implement different ways of talking with their customers, with um, you know the where they get their supplies from. And this actually forced us now to go, hey, what are the opportunities out of this and what can we do differently? Plus, if, I, if I'm honest, you've got time now to think about it as well. It's almost like we've been put on pause, right? And we've got a chance to go, hey, if we could start completely from scratch, what would we do differently? And that's where you kind of start from. I'm interested, um, Deborah, like once you do that, so there's no shortage of ideas, right? But ideas yeah. and execution is what's going to make the difference. And what's been really exciting is the innovation that has been coming out of the New Zealand economy. People have been pivoting um, or, you know, changing what they supply. You know, I've got another firm through Essentials. They're doing now care packages. Um, and so 
I guess, though, how do you uh, critique all the ideas and filter them down to you know, a short list of this is the ones that we want to go and explore? Have you got any advice in that area? Yeah, I mean, it's always a difficult one because I think you have to start with actually being completely broad and no idea is a bad idea. If you don't start with that on your mind, then you won't get the best ideas out there. And then, I mean, there's lots of different models you can use, but it's things like um, I've used different matrices where you can actually go through and, and list the, the, the cost, perhaps, of actually implementing it. It could be things like um, how much time or effort would it take? How does it fit in with our core purpose? And you start to score them um, according to those, those things that you're, um, you're marking them against, if you like. And then at the end of it, you can see that there are some ideas that are much stronger than others. But we've also got to make sure, and I really can't emphasize this enough, is make sure you do do the market validation. Make sure that the great idea that you've got, there is actually a real market for it because there's nothing worse than spending hours and hours of time and you think it's a fantastic idea, but then you go out there and nobody wants to buy it. And, and the other way I think that's always a, um, a, a, you know, one that gives you really clear feedback really pretty quickly is a crowdsourcing campaign. And if you, if you can't get it funded, then you know that potentially the market it's not um, ex accepting it, but when you can uh, get it funded, that it shows you that there is a market for it, and that would validate how many people um, you know were actually interested in what you're doing. Deborah, I'm I'm curious from your perspective because you're in touch with a lot of these um, a lot of these businesses. How how receptive are small and medium enterprise businesses to change? Um, I think traditionally maybe. Not so much, particularly if you've been, you know, um, creating a reasonable income for yourself through your business and haven't had to worry too much about it. But these are exceptional times, right? Things have changed so much now. And I think the first, if I'm honest, the first week, almost two weeks has been a bit of a, a shock and a grieving process. So we've seen people go through the whole, um, wow, didn't see that coming. Now what? Oh, my whole life has changed. And, and I think it's natural you know, to go through that grieving process for the fact that things have changed. Um, there'll be those who quite honestly will not want to change and whether we like it or not, we can't help them. But for those that do see this as being an opportunity, um, I think they they will they become a lot more receptive and they're looking for ways to, to do that. You know, how do I actually go about doing this? What are maybe two or three small things that you would encourage them to do before they think about just shutting up shop? <laughs> Okay, so I think that, as I said, the first thing that I would want to do is go back to basics and think about why they got into it, what their vision is, what they're trying to achieve. They've got to do be very realistic about what they think the changing marketplace, what impact that will have on their business. And sometimes you can't see that because, you know, when you, I own my own business as well. And when you, when you own your own business, you are very much emotionally engaged. You're also, you almost cling on to it for dear life. You don't want to necessarily see some other things. So getting somebody to, from the outside to have a look in. Now that can be a peer, that can be, a, you know, a professional person. It can be um, somebody, somebody else in the team, but having a really good, hard, honest look at it to see what's really going on. And, and thinking about what the impact will be. And so then once you know that, then you've got, think, I think sometimes getting together the ideas around what is possible as well before you go and engage with somebody. So you've actually got some kind of idea of where you're at right now, where you think you're going to be, some ideas on getting there. And then the, the people can help you to structure that. They can also ask the tough questions. One of my least favorite parts of my job is asking the really, really tough questions. So it's like getting somebody else who will actually come in there and challenge you a little bit around your thinking is really important. But do have something to go to them with. Don't go with a blank piece of paper. What if you're one of these people, maybe slightly lower in, in the food chain of the business that wants to go talk to the boss and, and bring up some of these, you know, interesting, slightly more innovative ideas? What are some of the tips to make it, you know, so they, they don't take that adversarial sort of posture that they just say, hey, I've had this idea. I thought it might be cool. What are the, how do you do it? First of all, encourage you. What's the worst that can happen? Your leader can go, nah, that's no good. You know, bugger off, basically. Um, so that's the worst that can happen. So why not take it to them? I think also it's important if you do want to take an idea to somebody, just remember that right at the moment, the leaders have got a huge amount of pressure on them. And so they're probably feeling a lot more than you really realize they're feeling. And try and flesh it out a little bit as well. You know, I've had this idea and I've given it some more thought. And this is what I think it might look like like rather than just going in and going I've got this great idea we should stop selling widgets and go online and do this I suppose there's um there's so many amazing examples in history right of companies that have come through this sort of t turmoil and decline as a bigger better more innovative company right 
there's a whole heap of opportunity here. I mean, I'm really excited about what this could mean for businesses. At the same time, very, um, I guess, empathetic to the real uh, hardcore cash flow challenges that people find themselves in. But my hope is that as a country, we can, uh, you know, really use this to become more innovative, uh, really, uh, you know, use it to uh, adapt and become more nimble and ultimately come out uh, you know, much better. I think that there is a sense with small and medium-sized businesses that it's a bit embarrassing to ask for help. You know, there's a sense of, oh my gosh, if I ask for help, it shows that I'm a failure. And often as a leader of an owner-managed business, you know, you're kind of seen as that guiding light. You really are the person everybody um, looks up to and, and you are the business. And so that asking for help can be a bit of a blow to our ego. And I like to try and reposition that with people. I say, hey, look, do you like helping people? And they go, yes, I do. And how does it make you feel when you help people? I feel really good. Okay, so then why aren't you allowing others to feel that great by helping you? Because at the end of the day, we don't have to do this alone. We've got these amazing minds all over the world, which we can connect with within our own businesses, with our own families. And so ask for help and just see what comes out of that. You never know what might come out of it. I completely agree with you. If you can really you know, step out and reach out, you know, Business New Zealand, Chamber of Commerce, there's a whole heap of people that can, uh, as a community, that are there to really support you. And many of them have had to innovate and they're available um, on, online for online connection now. Ingrid Cronin Knight, MIOB's country manager. Thank you so much. And Deborah Chantry, our special guest, entrepreneur business coach at Ventel Business Coaching. As I said, thank you both so much. Remember, we want to hear from you at home. In future episodes, we're talking about bouncing back from the brink, the rebuild from crisis, and also tax all the initiatives the government is pushing forward to alleviate some of the pain being inflicted by the crisis. Email your questions to video at nzherald.co.nz. I'm Will Trafford. Uh, stay safe, be kind to each other. Bye for now.